Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our clinical neuroscience uh, session this afternoon. And uh, my name is Andrea Kühn. I'm the head of the movement disorder and neuromodulation uh, unit at the charity at the Department of Neurology. And with me is my co-chair, Dr. Dominic Pieber from the Department of uh, Psychiatry. So we have a very interesting session ahead of us with uh, three tandem talks. And we start with a keynote lecture and the keynote lecture really bridges uh, neurology and uh, psychiatry here. We uh, can welcome Dr. Valerie Woon. She's a new psychiatrist at the University of Cambridge. Um, she's very interested in um, mechanism that underlies self-control and compulsivity and addiction. And um, she's using different techniques of uh, non-invasive neuromodulation, but also um, she uh, focuses on the effects of deep brain stimulation, especially uh, on cognitive and um, behavioral aspects of neuromodulation. And uh, we are very honored that uh, she will give a talk today Unfortunately, she can't be live with us. Um, she's at the moment in Shanghai in quarantine. Uh, so due to the pandemic situation and uh, she has unfortunately uh, bad internet connections. So she sent us a talk and uh, we uh, will play the video here for you. And she's very happy to answer your questions on the email later on. Um, and I can also try uh, to uh, maybe um, clarify some aspects of deep brain stimulation. So um, let's start with the keynote lecture of Dr. Valerie Woon on uh, neuromodulation. Uh, so thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak, um, particularly Andrea Kuhn. It's very much a pleasure to be here and to talk on this topic. So I'm going to talk about impulse control disorders and Parkinson's disease, and specifically closing the loop in the sense that I started with this um, topic in my PhD and then now have come back to it, um, particularly focusing on physiological recordings of the subthalamic nucleus. And we'll talk today about reward, risk, and emotion. So my group focuses on interventional and experimental psychiatry. And the overall goal is to identify modifiable biomarkers. I focus on a theory-driven approach. Um, here looking at intermediate cognitive endophenotypes that transcend uh, or cross between um, brain function and um, behavior. And today we're going to be looking at reward, risk, and affect. I'm going to touch on some of the main findings with regards to the impulse control disorders. I use a range of different modalities. Um, here again today, we'll talk a bit about computational modeling, physiology, and neuromodulation, specifically deep brain stimulation. So Parkinson's disease, um, a, a classic neuropsychiatric disorder, and we um, know it now to in, in, uh, implicate multiple neurotransmitter uh, neuropathology from dopaminergic systems, serotonergic, cholinergic, and noradrenergic. And beyond the motor symptoms, it's well established that there's a, a range of non-motor and neuropsychiatric symptoms that can occur comorbid. And particularly here today, we're gonna to talk about the impulse control disorders occurring at about 14 to 17%. So the ICDs in Parkinson's, um, are associated with dopamine agonists. And this um, is from the Daily Mail, which is a bit of a sensational um, online uh, news, um, newspaper. And um, this person had been involved in a class action lawsuit against um, one of the dopamine, dopamine agonist companies. Um, he had been involved in, um, after developing Parkinson's and starting on medications, um, gambling behaviors, losing a large amount of money, um, exposing himself and cross-dressing. So the title of the, of the um, article is Parkinson's medication turned me into a gambling gay sex thief. Having said that, um, there have been um, a series of class action lawsuits that were settled 
with regards um, to uh, this um, association. And uh, I have been involved as an expert witness on several of these lawsuits. Um, there was a large multi-center study that took place um, looking at the um, epidemiology of these behaviors and here showing um, a clear relationship with an increase in impulse control disorders in Parkinson's associated with a dopamine agonist. So 17% if you're on a dopamine agonist compared to 7% and also associated with greater levodopa dose. So the behavior itself only occurs in a certain portion of individuals. So there is an underlying susceptibility. So along the lines of an underlying history or family history of um, usually disorders of addictions or history of impulsivity or novelty seeking. And there's also an interaction with regards to dopaminergic medications interacting with underlying um, dopamine physiology. So this is a fairly basic um, introduction and basic kind of explanation. But here, the potential of dopamine agonists, which bind to um, presynaptic and postsynaptic dopamine receptors, may potentially influence uh, physiological dopaminergic activity. So in this case, you're potentially influencing phasic um, reward or um, loss prediction error. So this, as we all know, um, acts as a teaching signal this phasic dopaminergic activity from the midbrain. And uh, this is probably um, very well known uh, to you as a group, this increase in phasic dopamine activity to unexpected rewards, which then moves earlier in time to be associated with the prediction or the cue that predicts the reward. And if an unexpected lack of reward occurs, there's this phasic cessation of dopamine. And critically, when we think about potential dopamine agonists or perhaps the role of levodopa, we're thinking that it may interfere perhaps with this um, teaching signal, uh, both in reward and loss processing. So I'm just going to briefly discuss um, a couple of studies that, again, I did when I was in my PhD, and then I'll bring you into the more recent studies. So this was looking at impulse control disorders. Um, in Parkinson's, comparing them with controls. And here we looked at um, learning from rewards and losses. So straightforward, a two-choice probabilistic choice task, where you just to figure out which cue predicts either a reward or which cue predicts the loss and avoid the loss. And in this case here, um, using um, reinforcement learning um, uh, modeling, what we see here is um, a faster learning rate um, in the ICD patients when they're on dopaminergic uh, medications and specifically when regarding um, uh, learning from rewards or gains. And uh, you can see here that um, uh, this increase in um, reward prediction error activity also associated with, um, uh, also seen in the striatum. So what we're seeing before was this increase in sensitivity to learning from gains. And now this is in risky choices. And uh, here the, the subjects choose between a risky choice or a sure choice, and um, it's separated into um, rewards or losses. And again, what you see here is the ICD patients um, being more risky, particularly with gains, but not in the loss condition. And again, um, with imaging, uh, you see this decrease in activity in the ventral striatum and the orbitofrontal cortex to risky choices in the ICD patients. So here, this work suggesting greater sensitivity to gains and greater risk-taking behaviors. So now, how does this relate to the subthalamic nucleus? So, STN, the STN, as we know, is a very small nucleus found within the indirect pathway um, of the frontal striatal circuitry and uh, receiving significant prefrontal hyperdrive projections. And it plays a role in integration of motor, limbic, and cognitive function. It's a key target for deep brain stimulation. So targeting the dorsal motor region is effective for Parkinson's disease and targeting the anterior 
limbic cognitive region effective for obsessive compulsive disorder. And also some suggestion also from pre uh, clinical studies that targeting the STM may be effective um, in disorders of addiction. So a very intriguing nucleus. How does it relate to, to ICDs? Well, when patients present, Parkinson's patients present clinically for surgery, they're usually on fairly high doses of medication. So not infrequently, they do have um, a greater propensity for impulse control behaviors. And there's several studies, probably about four or five studies, suggesting that um, STMDDS can potentially improve or decrease the incidence or the um, frequency of impulse control behaviors in patients. So there's case series um, and uh, a series of um, cases that have been reported in pathological gambling, dopaminergic compulsive medication use, um, in hobbyism and um, in eating behaviors. What we then sought to do, and this is now moving 10 years forward uh, in terms of sort of my trajectory. So over the last couple of years, um, I've been collaborating with um, a group in Shanghai at Rujin Hospital, Professor Bo Min Sun. Um, and we've been looking at um, physiological recordings in the perioperative period. So Parkinson's patients, um, after they undergo the initial um, deep brain stimulation insertion, um, are then externalized um, in a stage procedure, and we can then record from the four contacts um, from the electrodes um, within the subthalamic nucleus, so shown here. And again, um, you can also look at the prefrontal uh, cortex activity, and this is scalp electrodes, and there's seven uh, contacts here. We, play a, we have them play a cognitive task. We we'll record from these four contacts bilaterally. We have the capacity also to stimulate in a fairly precise manner. Um, in this case, um, uh, stimulating on the right in a bipolar montage. Um, and we cannot record and stimulate at the same time. And actually when we're stimulating um, on, the, on the ipsilateral side, there is actually a fair degree of um, artifact also. Okay, so overall, uh, most of these studies, the goals are to identify um, ph physiological biomarkers based on a cognitive endophenotype type um, that may be responsive to acute deep brain stimulation. And the kind of larger goal is moving towards responsive stimulation for relapsing, remitting symptoms um, of a psychiatric nature. Okay, so let's start with talking about reward. So this is the monetary incentive delay task, a very well-established task in imaging circles, and it dissociates anticipation and outcome. So it shows you this cue, you're to respond to it, and then it then is, predicts an outcome. You can break it up into um, three conditions. So in this case here, reward condition, a loss condition, and a neutral condition. And again, um, I'm just going to focus in on the main findings. So we've actually had multiple different ways of analyzing this particular uh, uh, study for a variety of reasons. Um, having said that, um, the, what appears to be the case is we're seeing activity, particularly in more dorsal STN and not in the ventral STN. And these are the results from the dorsal STN findings. Um, there are results in the anticipation phase, but I'm just going to talk about the outcome phase relevant to this particular talk. So in the outcome phase, what you're seeing here is this increase in delta activity, so low free, very low frequency activity to reward outcomes, but you don't see it with neutral or loss outcomes. Now, what about its relationship with ICDs? Well, ICDs can be measured, the severity of ICDs can be picked up for screening with um, a questionnaire called the QUIP. And here, the higher the QUIP, the greater the ICD severity. And what you see here is um, greater ICD severity is associated with an increase in theta activity, um, particularly to reward outcomes. And you don't see it with neutral or losses. So this is very much in keeping and convergent with the previous data that I'd shown suggesting this relationship um, with, a, with a greater sensitivity to gains. 
Now, the subthalamic nucleus is probably most well known for its relationship with um, the adjustment of decision thresholds in the context of conflict. So there's lots of different ways of measuring conflict. Stroop tasks, the flanker task, the Simon task. And here, um, and I'm showing here, it's just the random kinetics dots task, where there's a series of dots moving around randomly, and some are moving more left and some are moving more right. And you just to make a decision, are they moving left or right? And when um, they're much more random and more difficult, it's more conflictual because it's more difficult to make a decision. So you can model these behaviors, looking at the reaction time and accuracy using drift diffusion modeling. And in this case here, when you're trying to make a decision, whether it's moving left or right, you're accumulating evidence and accumulating that evidence is quite noisy. Right? So you can see this noisy pattern here until you reach a decision threshold and you cross that boundary and you make a decision. Is it left or is it right? In this case here, left. So this decision threshold, this um, kind of boundary, is an index of how much evidence you accumulate. There's another measure you can also um, get, which is drift rate, or how quickly you reach a decision threshold, sort of an index of um, how you're um, assessing that evidence, the quality of the evidence. Now, um, there's um, multiple studies that have obviously been run in these types of uh, tasks. Um, and there's um, very good evidence to, to show that in the context of something that's more conflictual or difficult, you get this increase in a decision threshold okay, so the, in, within the subthalamic nucleus. And that allows you to then stop or slow responding. So you have more time to evaluate something that's difficult. And it suggests that comes from the mesial prefrontal cortex in terms of a, um, of a, um, a upstream signal. In obsessive compulsive disorder, there's evidence of, again, aberrant um, increase in decision thresholds, and it's in, within more specific contexts of conflict or uncertainty. And subthalamic um, uh, DBS, um, again, effective in OCD and also used in Parkinson's, um, appears to hasten or, or make responding quicker, particularly to conflict and it decreases this decision threshold. Okay, so suggesting that STN stimulation may increase conflict-related impulsivity. Now, what's intriguing is that in the context of risk, so where you're weighing decisions that have a certain probability of winning or a certain probability of losing, or a cost-benefit ratio, um, STN DBS appears to actually decrease risk-seeking, right? So it makes them less impulsive. And again, this is risk-seeking where the probabilities are known, right? as opposed to an ambiguous context where the probabilities are not known or an uncertain context. And this has been shown with chronic STN-DBS, with acute STN-DBS in both Parkinson's and OCD subjects. And we start to look at this in a bit more detail. So here we adapted the, the task from Patel and uh, used the a card sorting task. And this is a very simple game that, that quite a few people know. So you see this um, two decks of cards, one of which is open, the other one's closed. And you're just asked, bet if you think the next card is higher okay? or choose not to bet. And critically here, the betting or not betting, they're both controlled for motor um, action. So you perform a motor action regardless of whether you bet or don't bet. And if you bet and the card is higher, then you win money. And if you bet and the card is lower, um, you lose money. And if you don't bet, you'll see the card still, but there's no outcome. And this goes from one to nine. So there's a range of um, betting behaviors. And I'll just highlight the LFP findings. Again, there's a range of LFP findings with risk, uncertainty. I'm just highlighting one specific one here, which is in the context of um, the likelihood of betting. So if you're more likely to bet, your percent betting, you appear to have greater theta activity in the STN, particularly around this kind of four to five hertz range. OK, so again, in blue, this is the um, proportion of bets over the, the set of cards from 1 to 10. 
And we went on then on a second task to ask, or can we stimulate acutely um, with high frequency and influence um, betting behaviors? Again, this particular task actually has been shown in another group um, with acute DBS, um, Patel, uh, Patel et al, uh, to show that it does shift risk-taking behaviors, but we sought to look at it with LFP um, and we ran um, additional um, specific analyses. So here um, we have a one second stimulation that occurs just in the decision phase um, when they see the cards. And again, um, it's a high frequency stimulation. You can see here in red that the subjects um, become more risk averse. They prefer the, to, to not bet, um, but they actually take longer to do so. Okay, so that does differ from conflict. Um, they become um, less impulsive and they take longer to do so. Now, what about the underlying physiology? So here we're seeing that um, when you compare stimulation versus no stimulation, we see this increase in theta activity with stimulation that's not seen as much in uh, without stimulation. Okay. So this is a little bit unexpected because um, in the previous um, in the previous slide, I had shown that greater betting behaviors were associated with higher STM theta activity. Right? So here again, um, with stimulation, you see this increase in STM theta, but actually greater risk aversion, so lower betting behaviors. So what's going on here? Well, um, what actually appears to shift is the relationship with decision threshold between theta, STM theta, and decision threshold. Okay. So, as I said before, decision threshold is an index of how much of evidence you accumulate, and it's one of the parameters from drift diffusion modeling. And what you see is usually when you're without, not on stimulation, so um, STN function without stimulation, greater STN theta correlates positively with a decision threshold. So the greater the theta activity, the greater the evidence accumulation the more cautious you are and um, uh, the greater the, the decision thresholds. But STN stimulation reverses this relationship. So the greater the STN activity, the less evidence you accumulate, the less, the lower the STN theta activity um, and the lower, sorry, the lower the decision thresholds. So you see this inverse relationship that's significant, this interaction. And this has been shown before um, by Kavanaugh with Michael Frank's group. And again, here showing in blue um, this kind of this shift between the relationship um, when you're on medications versus off medications. Okay, so I am going to very briefly touch on affect here. And the reason I'm touching on it is in part because um, this particular study was. Um, uh, inspired by Andrea Kuhn's um, work. Um, so this is looking at emotional processing and alpha desynchronization in Parkinson's. So clinically, um, it's quite well established that with chronic STN DBS, um, a small proportion of patients can develop hypomania. It's about 4%. Very manageable. You decrease the stimulation power, you decrease the medication dose, or um, you shift to more dorsal uh, motor contacts. And when you systematically test on versus off STN DBS in either Parkinson's or OCD, um, you can see this impairment in recognition of negative emotions is quite specific to negative emotions. And you see the shift towards more positive um, uh, valence reporting, so away from negative. What about in terms of the physiology? So the affective stimulus is shown here at time zero, and this is late alpha desynchronization here in blue um, that occurs, uh, that starts about 0.5 seconds and peaks between one to two seconds. And this late alpha desynchronization, this is work from Andrea Kuhn, um, is correlated with um, subjective emotional valence ratings and not arousal and also um, associated with depression scores. So we just went on to ask, well, can we influence these emotional valence ratings by targeting alpha desynchronization using STN stimulation, but here acutely 
and with at alpha frequency. Okay, so um, we just showed um, negative and neutral images, and here we paired one of the negative it's one set of the negative images with stimulation. So either at 130 hertz or at 10 hertz on two different days, and um, this and um, what you're seeing here is um, stimulation again from the right STN. Um, we have been recording from the left STN, but I don't report uh, the specific findings here. And just to summarize the main findings, if you're stimulating at 10 hertz or alpha frequency, um, what the individual or the, the patient experiences is this um, shift towards a more positive um, subject of valence. So they subjectively report that a, that a picture that's negative is actually more positive than it is. Okay? And you don't see that with 130 hertz, it's quite specific to 10 hertz and specific to valent, and we don't see that with arousal. There's also a finding with regards to baseline depression. So those that are more depressed appear to respond greater to this positive bias at 10 hertz. So potentially suggesting there might be an intriguing um, response um, that uh, uh, one might expect in terms of patients who have comorbid depression. So in summary, um, we see that I see that, that, that you know back about ten years ago um, when I was doing my PhD, um, I showed that ICDs and Parkinson's patients showed a greater reward bias and greater risk taking to gains. And I've sort of circled back and um, started looking at this um, with physiology and stimulation. Um, ICDs and Parkinson's um, appear to show greater sensitivity towards reward-related outcomes, um, and, and they express greater delta power uh, to reward outcomes. So it's in keeping with what we're seeing with a greater reward bias. We see this um, differential effect on impulsivity um, with high-frequency STN DBS. So in the context of con conflictual responding, they become faster or more impulsive, but they become more slower and more cautious and more risk averse um, in, in, in risk taking behavior, in risk taking. And we suggest that um, even though these effects are differential, or, or appear quite different behaviorally, the underlying mechanism of this reversal of at the STN theta decision threshold relationship may be similar. So STN theta may be associated with greater evidence accumulation or decision thresholds that under stimulation appear to reverse this relationship and it becomes associated with lower evidence accumulation. And then finally, in the context of emotional processing, um, stimulating at alpha frequency of the STN appears to enhance subjective positive emotional bias and particularly in those with higher dep baseline depression and then um, targeting the more ventromedial limbic cognitive context. So I am um, in mandatory quarantine and with really poor internet access. Um, so I'm going to suggest that you contact me with any questions by email. I will try to attend the live Q&A, but I can't guarantee you that um, the, my Wi-Fi will hold out for this. So this is my group. I'm very grateful to the group at Rurgeon Hospital um, and uh, all the members at Rurgeon Hospital who have been amazing. Um, and um, again, to uh, my group here, um, particularly Louis Mansur, Leke Mandali, um, Ying Zhao, uh, Sarab Sankasari, they've all been um, instrumental in, these, uh, in this particular set of studies. Um, so I will be eventually actually looking for more, po more postdocs, PhD students um, and RAs. So uh, do actually uh, contact me um, and feel free to email me with regards to this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation, Andrea. Bye-bye. Well, thank you very much, Valerie. I'm not sure if uh, she's online. She said she tries, but uh, she also gave you the email. 
uh, for questions, so don't hesitate to ask her. I think it was a great talk and a great overview on Parkinson's disease risk taking behavior and the modulation by deep brain stimulation. So um, ask your questions and um, if you get even more interested, um, as far as I understood it, she even proposed um, some positions. Uh, so we will go on with our first tandem talk um, and this is now um, neurology. We uh, can welcome uh, Professor Haggai Bergman uh, from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Haggai Bergman is uh, one of the pioneers of deep brain stimulation. He has uh, in his early work uh, set the basis for understanding how deep brain stimulation could work and where we have to stimulate by uh, his studies in MPTP monkeys where he could show that the lesioning the subthalamic nucleus uh, led to motor improvement in the Parkinsonian monkey and now he's going further on uh, understanding the mechanisms of deep brain stimulation and improving the therapy especially towards adaptive deep brain stimulation and that's the overarching topic also uh, on this tandem talk uh, the uh, junior clinician scientist today is uh, dr lucia feldman uh, she's a neurologist in my lab and uh, started on uh, local field potential recordings in parkinsonian patients uh, with chronic sensing technology with a new stimulator that's available uh, since about a year now and um, she's working on uh, establishing the adaptive stimulation for Parkinsonian patients here in Berlin. So we first um, have the presentation from Haggai Bergman and again that will be a video and unfortunately Haggai uh, could not make it today. First, our session was planned for Friday afternoon when we invited him. And um, since we switched, he couldn't arrange to be online for Q&A. But I think Lucia will try to take all the questions. And we have the two talks uh, in a row and then uh, some time for questions afterwards. So um, please start with the video from Haggai Beckman. Just have to... Uh, agree with it? I, uh, yes, I of course I agree. Ah, I I will get the message that I should agree. Yeah, I think it's okay now. I think yeah, now it started, and I'm asked to talk to you about the data <laughs> agreements. Okay, great. So I will mute myself now. I think so to avoid any noise. And um, thank you very much already. <laughs> so. I think, um, yeah, you can start any time, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, everybody. It is my pleasure uh, uh, to give my talk uh, at least uh, through the Zoom now. I apologize for recording it. Uh, I was supposed uh, uh, to speak on Friday and I set another meeting for Saturday. So, at least we are able to record it. Uh, and uh, Shabbat Shalom, happy Saturday to all of you. So I'm going to speak about sleep in the LC and the Parkinsonian basal ganglia network. I should start by, uh, by thanks. So first to Dr. Lucia Feldman, that uh, uh, I am very happy to collaborate with her and all the Charti uh, group. Uh, to family, patient, student, friend, and mentor, supporting agency and foundation. This is my disclosure that are not related to the current uh, study. Uh, what I'm going to speak today, I'm going to give you a very short introduction to the basal ganglia, Parkinson's disease, deep brain stimulation, and sleep. Then I will speak about our results uh, recording in the non-human primate of the basal ganglia during normal sleep. In the MPTP treated model of Parkinson disease, again, recording during sleep. And then I will speak about a new method for deep brain stimulation. This is frequency and phase specific closed loop DBS treatment. And I will speak about our dream 
to use it in order to treat the Parkinson sleep disorder. And of course, there will be summary and conclusion at the end. So uh, let's go to the first uh, topic, a very short introduction to the basal ganglia, Parkinson, DBS, and sleep. The basal ganglia are a major network of the forebrain. You can see here the basal ganglia that as many other network of the brain connect between the area of the brain that encode the current state and the area of the brain, the central nervous system that are related to movement. And actually there is a kind of continuous loop when our motor cortex or brainstem motor center and force and action, this action is changing the world as a result of this, there is a new state and or reward coming, and we have this loop going through the, to the, through the neural network, the basal ganglia, uh, and going all over. The, the, the basal ganglia are the most densely uh, brain area to be innervated by neuromodulation, especially dopamine, but not only dopamine, also acetylcholine, serotonin, and histamine, and they affect procedural reinforcement learning. They are a key play, player in major human neurological disease, like Parkinson's disease, depression, OCD, ADHD, and schizophrenia, and we know it because all this uh, 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 disorder are affected by dopamine or serotonin pharmacological treatment. And finally, why we use non-human primate is because the basal ganglia of the non-human primate and much less of the rodent are very similar to the human basal ganglia. What about Parkinson's disease and, uh, and DBS? Parkinson's disease is very common. 1% of the population older than 60. It, it includes motor symptoms like akinesia, rigidity and tremor, but also emotional, cognitive and sleep deficit. The motor symptoms follow the generation of the midbrain dopaminergic neuron and that lead to dopamine depletion in the striatum and synchronous beta oscillation as you may see over here in this recording after a depletion of dopamine in the monkey brain by the MPTP neurotoxin in comparison to the normal activity that you can see over here. The ter therapy first line is dopamine replacement therapy. However, after five to 10 years, on fluctuation in dyskinesia will appear. And then we are actually usually go to a subthalamic nucleus or GPI, internal segment of the globus pallidus, different stimulations that are very, very effective, second-line therapy, with more than 200,000 patients operated uh, over the last uh, 25 years. What about sleep? Hopefully everybody know, uh, of you know uh, sleep. It is a recurrent state of loss of consciousness, relative motor inactivity, and reduced response to external event. It plays a major role in body homostasis and memory consolidation. There are many models for sleep and many neuronal systems that are correlated with sleep-wake cycles that you can see over here. But the basal ganglia and dopamine system are traditionally ignored. But this is very surprising because we are very aware of the sti stimulating effect of dopaminergic agent and that sleep disorder are very common in patients with basal ganglia related disorder. And finally, again, back to the issue why to use non-human primate is because the sleep architecture is very, very similar between human and non-human primate where rodent are having very, very different sleep architecture. So now we can go to the, uh, to the first study, looking at the basal ganglia network during normal sleep. You see uh, our monkey in our animal facility uh, sleeping as a group together. You see where we record in the brain uh, of, of our monkey, and you see typical recording uh, where each line is uh, a single, a single spike. But now we can go to our 
מנקיז, ‫הוא can do polysomonography ‫to record EEG, EOG, eye movement and the EMG, ‫and then actually characterize ‫the different stage of sleep as in the human, ‫between wakefulness, shallow sleep, N1 and 2, N3 slow wave sleep, and finally REM, with you see the typical rapid eye movement during REM sleep, and you can have the hypnogram uh, of our monkey, again, looking very, very similar to what we are used to see in our human patient. And then we can do recording, and you see here three electrodes in the external segment of the globus pallidus of a wake monkey during slow wave sleep. You see very strong reduction in the discharge rate and a change in the pattern, and back to the REM sleep that look like a very awake state, even this small pause that you see over here, we don't see it during this example in the REM sleep. And indeed, when we do the analysis, the formal analysis of the firing rate and the coefficient of variation of the interspike interval, a method that actually show the variability of discharge, we can see this reduction in the discharge during slow wave sleep and back to the awake uh, in, the, in the REM and the same for the uh, firing pattern. Interestingly, when we are looking at the correlation, what we see is that unlike in the uh, cortex and the thalamus that are getting very much synchronized during the slow of sleep, the basal ganglia, the normal basal ganglia, although they are having this slow oscillation, they are not synchronized at this deep state of sleep in the normal monkey. What happened in the basal ganglia uh, when we are going to the Parkinson disease? So again, what we do is that we use the MPTP neurotoxin and the MPTP neurotoxin kill most of the unit in the substantia nigra pars compacta, wash out of dopamine in the dorsal striatum, and we know for many, many years that Synchronous oscillation, especially at the beta domain, are appearing in the basal ganglia of the uh, MPTP treated monkey. But now we look at the Parkinsonian. First, we look at their sleep, and you see that if this is the hypnogram during the uh, before in the healthy monkey, the hypnogram of the a Parkinsonian monkey is completely fragmented. The monkey is actually switching many, many times to wake, to wake sleep, and uh, uh, there are much less episodes of REM, a, a very, very similar uh, hypnogram to our Parkinson patient with severe insomnia after uh, the development of their sleep disorder uh, uh, due to Parkinson's disease. And when we record the basal ganglia activity during this insom insomnia sleep in the uh, Parkinsonian monkey, we see that now the beta oscillation are highly synchronized, as you may see also over here in this uh, formal analysis. So unlike the sleep of normal monkey, that was characterized by unsynchronized activity. Now we have this B synchronized beta oscillation that persists during the abnormal sleep of the Parkinsonian monkey. Can we help uh, our Parkinson patient uh, to have better sleep? Yes, we believe that we can help, and more important, we believe that we should try hard to help them, because we know that sleep is the brain method of worst disposal. We know that during slow sleep, actually we are cleaning our, our beta amyloid, and if we don't clean enough our beta amyloid, actually we are coming into a kind of a negative, a, a kind of feedback loop with more 
brand disorder and more alpha and, and, and more beta amyloid. And it probably the same for the alpha synuclein. So therefore, we believe that sleep disorder initiate and aggravate the brain disorder and treatment of sleep dis disorder might help us to improve our patient Parkinson disease and other basal ganglia related disorder. Why not just to use pharma? Because pharma is not good enough. We know that pharma is not a real treatment of sleep disorder, and we can understand why. Because if all this, all this neuromodulator like dopamine, not only affecting our basal ganglia, it is also affecting our cortex, also affecting our spinal cord. It is clear that it is very difficult to find the optimal pharma therapy for sleep. So we should go to DBS. What do we know about DBS? As I mentioned, that there are many, many patients already operated for DBS. What is the mechanism of DBS? It is still not clear, but if we believe in this model of the brain that we have our state to action loop and the basal ganglia are the automatic default loop that only when the basal ganglia are not working, it moves the control to the cortical Daniel Kahneman system too to take care of the problem that the basal ganglia cannot do it. But now in Parkinson disease, the basal ganglia are abnormal and therefore by deep brain stimulation, we inactivate the basal ganglia and return the control to the cortical system. And the advantage of DBS, that unlike ablation, DBS is reversible and adjustable. But now, actually, we believe that with DBS, we can do more than mimic ablation. Because what we, if we and other people found, that if we stimulate at the down-going phase of brain oscillation, we really inactivate the system. But if we stimulate at the upgoing phase, actually we augment the oscillation. So now with this phase specific uh, stimulation, we can augment the good oscillation and ameliorate or suppress the bad oscillation. And therefore DBS actually give us a double sword that actually we can help the good guys like the delta oscillation and abolish the beta oscillation during sleep. So this is the end of my talk. We can go to summary and conclusion. Basal ganglia activity is strongly correlated with weak sleep stages and probably pay, play a major role in sleep regulation. In Parkinsonism, beta oscillatory persists during sleep and they are correlated with the fragmentation and reduced quality of the Parkinsonian sleep. If sleep disorder have a causal role in the progression of Parkinson disease, the alpha synuclein cleaning hypothesis, then improving Parkinson sleep quality might be the first treatment that will slow disease progression. So toda, thank you in Hebrew for your attention. Shabbat Shalom, I wish that you will have a good meeting then after and as always, love, be live and sleep tight uh, after this wonderful meeting. Thank you for listening and uh, good again, Shabbat Shalom. Yes. Yes, Shabbat Shalom, um, Haggai and so, yeah, um, <laughs> it was actually a really great pleasure to record this talk with Ragai, but uh, my uh, Hebrew attempts um, <laughs> not for today. So, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today in this tandem talk uh, at this very nice symposium um, with one of the pioneers of uh, DBS, Ragai Bergman. Um, it's a real shame that he's not here today for the Q&A because he's also a great teacher and explainer and uh, a wonderful person. So it was really nice to have this and it's an honor to present with him. Um, 
Yes, uh, and today I will be talking about the path towards adaptive deep brain stimulation and the chronic biomarkers uh, that are necessary for personalized neuromodulation. And I will start by uh, briefly introducing Parkinson's disease and DBS, and then move on to perioperative basal ganglia electrophysiology and uh, briefly introduce the topic of adaptive deep brain stimulation and uh, continue with the evaluation of the chronic biomarkers and give you a brief outlook on the clinical translation. So um, to give you the clinical perspective once more, so Parkinson's disease is uh, one of the most important movement disorders, of course, um, but from the previous two talks, uh, it's also much more than a movement disorder. So here we can see a patient after 20 years of Parkinson's disease and 10 years of DBS who has a very good motor control. She's barely impaired and um, you can see her moving very independently and as the stimulation is turned off for just a very brief period, you can see that the symptoms recover and that she's uh, severely impaired with the major uh, motor symptoms, um, bradykinesia in this case, so the other cardinal symptoms of Parkinsonism would be rigidity and tremor, of course, but um, bradykinesia uh, in this patient is very striking. And you can really see that deep brain stimulation is a great therapy for restoring the quality quality of life. And on the other hand, deep brain stimulation also made it possible for us to record from deep brain structures uh, and have electrophysiological human data from the basal ganglia. And as Valerie Woon in her talk also talked about it, um, we used to have this very brief window um, between the two-staged uh, surgical procedure of several days, and this really accelerated our knowledge about the pathophysiology of um, Parkinsonism and um, helped us in understanding uh, our patients a bit better. And uh, you can see in the upper right panel that um, a very robust finding in these uh, perioperative recordings was that during off-medication we have this very high um, oscillatory activity in the beta frequency band, which would be 13 to 30 hertz, uh, low beta 13 to 20, and that we really can see that this is also suppressed through medication. And in the lower panel, you can see that during stimulation, it's a bit difficult to record because of the stimulation artifact, so that would be the red bar. But uh, as stimulation is turned off, uh, you can see that um, slowly the beta frequency band activity recovers again with this red um, activity bar in the time frequency plot. And um, you can see in the black bars above that during the motor task, um, the performance is very good during stimulation, but as the beta band activity recovers, also the motor activity is impaired again. And um, we are now thinking about how to best use this uh, also in the clinics. And the first step where it is already used, in fact, uh, is the um, operation room where um, Hagai Bergmann and um, the Alpha Omega company um, had a software tool developed um, which calculates in real time where um, we find high beta activity um, as we insert the electrodes during the surgery. And uh, this really helps us in navigating towards the right spot. Still, uh, there are limitations of deep brain stimulation as well. So for at the moment, we really have a continuous stimulation protocol, which, uh, of course, we can change the parameters during programming visits. But apart from that, the patient always receives the uh, more or less stable and same therapy. And we also have challenges with DBS, so there are some side effects like dyskinesia, um, there is the possibility of stimulation of adjacent anatomical structures, uh, for example the internal capsule or lemnisci mediali, which would then result, for example, in uh, dysarthria or um, um, paresthesia. And we can also see over the course of the disease that there is a wearing off of effectiveness. We have the problem of battery consumption during stimulation, which means that uh, the patients will have to, after, for example, five years, have a replacement of the IPG in additional surgeries. And of course, um, we can also see with a high variability of symptomatology that this is a very individual disease as well. And one idea how to tackle these issues is um, the concept of adaptive deep brain stimulation. 
And you can see in this picture in the, um, that we have these brain electrodes inserted in the subthalamic nucleus. We receive uh, the electrophysiological signal, for example, beta band activity. We could feed in additional um, signals such as uh, peripheral sensors for tremor, for example. And this is all fed into a processing unit um, with an adaptive control algorithm and uh, a stimulation that is adapted to the current state of the patient is delivered. So the first group to really show this in an experiment was again Hagai Bergman's group in 2011 and they um, showed it in the MPTP monkey model in a very promising study that indeed uh, closed loop stimulation um, is very superior um, in a motor control as you can see in the right panel with, the, uh, with this red bar where you, we have the improved kinesis in comparison to standard DBS. So, uh, and since then, there was the attempt to translate this to um, human patients, of course. And 10 years on, there have been very promising results there as well but it's not yet in the clinical application. And um, two major groups working on this were um, the Oxford group around Peter Brown and Simon Little there, um, who really for the first time showed that this is a concept which will work in humans. Um, they could show that um, not only do we have little battery consumption, we also have much uh, improved motor performance even uh, compared to continuous DBS. And uh, over the course of time, even the necessity for stimulation is even reduced. So there might be plastic effects that could even contribute to much better motor control. And the other group working on this is the Priori group in Milano, um, who were the first to record um, adaptive stimulation for even eight hours. So in the upper panel, that would be the patient off stimulation for eight hours with just the medication. And below, you can see that um, the beta band activity is much stabilized during um, during adaptive stimulation and there, that there might be a necessity for less stimulation, for example, if the dose of um, medication is at its peak. And here in Berlin, we are also working on this. So um, this is the project we are working on in the SFB in the Retune with um, Johannes Busch. And you can see one of the problems of the translation of uh, adaptive stimulation to the clinics uh, in our experimental setup. So uh, it's still a very excessive setup, um, but there are really very interesting questions that we still have to answer. For example, what is the best signal source? What might be the best biomarker? What could be the best stimulation algorithm um, if we think about Ragai's talk with a phase-dependent stimulation? But at the moment, for the step towards clinical translation, of course, we have also computational limitations for implantable devices. And one important question you can see in the above uh, picture that the patient is acutely post-operative and restricted through a lot of um, cables also for the um, movement. Uh, and we really don't re know completely how the biomarker will behave in chronic, freely moving patients months after the surgery. And this is now with a percept neurostimulator a great opportunity because now we have an implantable device which has uh, extra electrophysiological monitoring capabilities. And um, not only can we use it directly at the bedside to have an idea about the electrophysiological state of the patient with these power spectra that you can see in the right lower panel there, but we can also stream full LFP data, so local field potential data, which would be the electrophysiological data we are working with and which is also important is that um, with the percept we will have the potential of uh, adaptive stimulation in clinical practice very soon. And we looked at this in a patient uh, three months after surgery. So you can see that it is a very relaxed recording atmosphere with a patient moving freely. So we can stream the data via Bluetooth. And in the right panel, you can see whether the stimulation is switched on. Now it's switched on and you can see the patient's bradykinesia is improved. And as the stimulation is turned off, it is uh, impaired again, and you can see in the time frequency plot also the suppression of the beta band activity. Now it's suppressed, and now you can see with the stimulation off that we have a high um, beta band activity at 15 hertz. 
So we wanted to confirm this in more patients and had a larger cohort uh, in which we looked in a standardized protocol of stepwise stimulation increase and uh, at the same time recorded resting state activity of the electrophysiology and also the motor activity with the accelerometer um, as a marker for bradykinesia in the velocity recordings. And you can see that um, as the stimulation increases, we also have uh, improved velocity uh, while also the beta activity is suppressed. This is one patient uh, also three months after surgery. We did this in 10 patients and uh, this is again the time frequency plot representation of the protocol with a stepwise stimulation increase and this red beta activity being suppressed after a while or after as the stimulation increases. And this is in a dose dependent manner as the stimulation increases and we can also see in, the, uh, in panel C that this uh, also is mirrored by the motor performance improvement. And um, we also had a look into this because if you want to have a stable biomarker, it should also be really specific. And um, indeed, uh, this uh, change that we see with the improvement of clinical effect is very specific for low beta and high beta activity, but um, low beta even in a more pronounced way. And um, the very important aspect of this, of course, is also that uh, is it is really uh, very closely related with the motor improvement. So during off-stimulation state, you have this very high beta peak, uh, even in the mean figure around 15, 16 hertz, which is then suppressed as the clinical effect of the stimulation improves. And we also employed a linear mixed effects model in which uh, low beta power was a strong predictor for motor improvement. And um, the next thing that we will be looking at is um, this uh, whole development of the um, beta band biomarker, which is very individual as well, on an even broader um, time frame uh, of days to weeks. <laughs> And we can have uh, the opportunity now to see how long-term therapy changes are mirrored in the biomarker. We can see individual symptoms and fluctuations. We can assess uh, if th therapy changes have an effect, like in the upper panel uh, on April 10th, the, the patient switched off the uh, stimulation for a while and we see that beta is indeed going up again. And of course, we also want to assess additional symptoms and individual specifics or thinking about, for example, sleep, also the circadian rhythmicity. And this is uh, also what I would like to further pursue with Haggai in future. So as a summary and conclusion, we can see that the dream of individualized deep brain stimulation in clinical practice is really coming closer. We have deep brain stimulation as an effective treatment of symptoms in Parkinson's disease patients and uh, research um, also uh, perioperatively and chronically has shown that beta frequency band activity is a biomarker correlating with motor performance and modulated through ter therapy. And this is uh, even great to see now with the Percept IPG that we have very high data quality to also um, show this in, con in chronic freely moving patients. And um, now the next step, of course, is to realize adaptive stimulation in the clinics. And um, this is what we are going to do next. And this is eagerly anticipated. And with this, I would like to thank all the people I'm working with, um, especially, of course, Andrea Kühn and the um, uh, Julia Neumann, Roxanne Lofredi and Johannes Busch, um, whom I really worked a lot with uh, on these adaptive and chronic data. And uh, of course, also Hagar Bergmann, who is a great mentor and uh, discussant and um, whom I hope to visit soon again and uh, my other collaborators. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Well, thank you very much, Lucia. That was a great presentation on the recent work on adaptive stimulation. So I don't see questions in the chat yet, um, but you mentioned that um, so beta activity obviously is a well-known biomarker now from recorded from the basal ganglia. Could you um, extend a little bit maybe on which other um, strategies could be followed up to have 
to use biomarkers maybe from the cortex or even variables um maybe yes. you, you want to give yeah. us a sh very brief overview on this Yes, um, thank you very much for this question. So uh, indeed, um, we see that um, beta band activity is a very good biomarker for bradykinesia, and this is also what we assessed in, in this study. But for example, for tremor patients, um, uh, and we had some tremor dominant patients in this cohort as well, it is not such a clear picture. And uh, for those, for example, either low frequency activity, which can be contaminated though through um, movement artifacts as well, but also um, peripheral sensors uh, like wearables, like an, a continually, uh, continuously wearable accelerometer could be a very uh, good feedback. And uh, first studies have been realized on this as well. And um, yes, exactly. So uh, for other diseases, even other biomarkers could also be um, um, helpful. And uh, yeah, there is yes. continuous ongoing work on this. And uh, for example, for sleep also, um, we could see that different um, frequencies could be um, of uh, different importance from, uh, during modulation. So there is really a great uh, discussion going on also for other symptoms. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have no questions, but I think we are running late anyway in time. So I hand over to my co-chair, to Dominic Pieber, to announce uh, the second tandem talk. Hi. Thank you, Professor Kuhn, for guiding us through this first half of today's clinical session. Um, dear colleagues, dear attendees, um, my name is Dominic Pieber. I'm a psychiatrist and a fellow of the BIA Charité Clinician Scientist Program in the Department of Psychiatry at Charité Campus Benjamin Franklin. And I'm thrilled and honored to co-chair today's clinical session on clinical neuroscience together with Professor Kuhn from the Department of Neurology here at Charité. And we're going to continue with two more tandem research talks. So please let me introduce Professor John Torres, Director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deacon Medical Center, a Harvard Medical School affiliated teaching hospital where he also serves as a, an assistant professor and staff psychiatrist. Interestingly, Professor Torres not only has a background in psychiatry, but he also has a background in electrical engineering and computer sciences, and he's an expert on clinical and biomedical informatics. Moreover, Professor Torres is an active uh, investigator in the potential of mobile mental health devices and technologies in psychiatry. Professor Torres today will be joined by Dr. Eva Friedel, a former fellow of the BIA Charité Clinician Scientist Program in the Department of Psychiatry at Charité Campus Mitte. Dr. Friedel just completed her fellowship in 2020 and her research in this program focused on imaging epigenetics and alcohol use disorder. So please put your hands together and welcome with me Professor Torres and Dr. Friedel, who are gonna give their talk right after each other and then we're gonna sum up with a joint discussion. You, excellent. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Mitchiri Keshwan is my mentor who's not here, but I want to put his name here because I think many of you may have worked with him before, and so much of his work is related to what he does. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about smartphones, the devices that all of us have, consumer wearables, not actigraphy, and I'll explain why in a second. So this was a recent review paper that our team did of advancing translational research through the interface of digital phenotyping and neuroimaging and narrative review. What was interesting about this paper is looking again at what information we can get about behavior and symptoms in real time from smartphones and what we can learn from neuroimaging. There actually are very few protocols or studies that are beginning to put them together. They do exist and we cover them in this review. But it's very clear this is a huge area of opportunity for both fields of looking at kind of mobile digital health and clinical neurosciences. So with that framing, I think it's interesting to think about what does it really take to make smartphones and digital tools really to transform mental health and clinical care. 
And in this very short time period, we're going to go through a little bit of a whirlwind, but really what is the type of data and how do we collect this data from consumer devices? What are some interesting applications and algorithms, new types of data that we can capture that are perhaps useful for both clinical care, but also for advancing clinical neuroscience and research? And at the very end, I'll touch about how we can really make this translational research. What's very exciting about mobile and digital work is that we can use it really with patients in the clinic today, as well as collect fantastic data to advance research for tomorrow. I think as all of us know, I, there's self-report remains the basis of a lot of our work, especially in psychiatry. I work especially in psychosis and schizophrenia. And certainly technology will not replace self-report, but I think there's more and more research coming out, of course, of how complex people's experiences are. People's experiences we know change over time, they change over environment. These are dynamic illnesses, just as we know that Parkinson's are dynamic illnesses, they change. And again, so even at the most basic level, if we begin collecting symptoms on smartphones, more and more research is coming out every month now at this point, really saying how complex these relationships are. And so if the phones just worked as surveys, we'd be far along. I think all of us know if we have a smartphone, it does a lot more than just do surveys. Certainly, in Europe, you all have GDPR, which certainly gives you some protection from privacy laws. In the US, we don't have GDPR. But the point being, I think this paper summed up well saying, right now, kind of, especially in healthcare, we're only sparingly leveraging the true capabilities of smartphones, such as sensors and alternative paradigms and analytical methods. So these devices can potentially do a lot more. And sometimes this is called digital phenotyping, a word you may have heard of. Sometimes it's called social sensing, sometimes it's called mobile sensing. But the idea is, again, there's active and passive data. Active data would be surveys I put in a darker blue, and passive data would be different sensors you could collect from different consumer devices, especially a phone, that may give you some idea into behavior. And you can imagine anything could be surveyed from someone. You could ask someone, what is your step count? Or a phone could give you step count. You can get raw GPS from the phone. And of course, you could turn that into different features like home time or kind of number of locations visited. And we'll talk about that in a second. There's active and passive data. Passive, again, something you don't have to actively engage with. So there's many ways to get this data. We've built an open source platform. It's completely free. All of the code is on GitHub. And different data streams you can collect, you can imagine, are cognition related. We'll talk about those quickly. Symptom related step, sleep, and exercise, kind of mobility-related, socialness. You can also get two from anonymized call and text logs and screen time metrics. And of course, you can connect to different consumer wearables. What's interesting is once you're beginning to collect data like this, if you think about how many surveys people can take or how much GPS points or how much accelerometer you can get in real time, you actually can get terabytes of information on a cohort very quickly. And it becomes an interesting challenge if you don't really think about what is even going to be the database and data structure for it. In thinking about this research, so again, before we even approach clinics or we approach patients for IRBs or consortium, we have to think about what is a temporal slice, what is the data structure. And what's interesting in making our data structure the same for almost all types of data, whether you're taking this is a modified trails A and B test or a survey we've begun to kind of put into a unified data stream. And I'll explain why it's useful later, but in building this platform, I said the link at the bottom left, you can find our documentation and code on GitHub, but not only building a smartphone app, right? You need an iOS and Apple app to get data. You of course need a database we talked about that is very flexible, it can handle terabytes of information coming in high throughput data. And then you need kind of your analytical engine. And putting these pieces together, is interesting. We've done it in some ways, but we've also shared this clearly with many different teams around the world that have kind of put together different pieces from it. A lot of the teams who work with focus on schizophrenia, but certainly not all of them, and people are doing different things with it. So one thing, just if we think about even simple tests of the TRAILS A and B test, that perhaps is used more in neurology, in adapting it to be on a smartphone, what we first realized is people wanted to make it more gamified. So it looked like this. And if you think about it on a smartphone, we don't 
we can record more than how many mistakes someone made and how long it took them to complete the test, right? You actually can, as you see here, really get the whole sequence of someone went through it, right? It's a different way to look at cognitive testing or different assessments. It's a temporal process. It's where you got stuck. We can do this repeatedly over time. You can imagine we can look at the environment. Was it done at home? Was it done after a day of good sleep, after bad sleep? Was it done when mood was high or low? So there's a lot of context. And we're not saying this is equal to the trails A or B. But I think what's interesting is the same paradigm can work across different things. So this paper came out earlier this week that smartphone-based neuropsychological assessment of Parkinson's disease, feasibility, validity, and contextually driven variables in cognition. So we could use the same app and of course, outside of schizophrenia, and again, still very preliminary, what we can do with this data, again, it's not equal to a, a gold standard yet, and we don't want to make bold claims and kind of push the science too far, but it's interesting to think about what we can do with these mobile assessments and how they can work in different fields. We've built other tasks that we're still learning about, so I'll skip over those. What I think becomes interesting about using Mobile devices and smartphones is one example. This is a map of the state of Massachusetts where I'm located in Boston is here. And green space is measured in the US. There's something called NDVI, it's used in other places, but high means high green space, low means low green space. And you can see that we could basically, for a cohort of patients with schizophrenia, we followed them for a month and we got permission that every time we got a GPS ping, which was several times a minute, we convert that into a green space metric. So really what we want to do here is a simple correlational, not causation, but really say, is there a correlation between people who have high green space exposure and lower symptoms? And there was, so this will set us up to do another experiment, but we can begin to quantify things that we couldn't before, like green space exposure. So it's not where you live, what your address is, it's what was your green space exposure. We can collect a lot of different metrics. This is just to show that from GPS, we can get different things like home time, radius of gyration, different lengths of trips people did. From column text, we can get different metrics. The metrics that seem to always have the most clinical significance, at least to classic symptoms, are usually ones of entropy or variance, kind of circadian routine over a week, weekend routines. It's never the absolute number of any of these smartphone metrics. It's how they vary across and with time. We've also been looking at this to try to predict relapse in schizophrenia to understand the context that drives someone to maybe have hospitalization or increasing psychotic symptoms. So you can imagine we can, of course, have survey data from before, but we can have sleep mobility, we can have attention concentration. We have to use an algorithm called anomaly detection. I'll show you what it looks like on the next slide. So what we can do is for an individual person, we can again collect mobility, cognition, screen time, sleep duration, social surveys. We can bootstrap a threshold significance and run anomaly detection on each day and really look at are there days for an individual person when they have statistical anomalies running anomaly detection, red is when the person relapsed. And what we've noticed is for each person, there's a different combination of anomalies that are associated with relapse, which kind of makes sense clinically what we see. So I think what's nice about a method like this is it lets us kind of figure out personal triggers for relapse in a quantifiable way that we could then go back to clinical neuroscience and say, why do these people have a pattern of relapse that's associated, say, with changes in sleep, in surveys, or sociability, say, in mobility? We're beginning to, of course, if we can begin to detect relapse or symptom changes, we can, of course, use smartphones for more clinical, right, to intervene and offer people things to hopefully bring symptoms down. So I think that's the frontier and next part of this research is matching the sensing with interventions on the smartphone as well. For sake of time, I'll skip, but we can certainly do clustering of symptoms and longitudinal clustering of symptoms in networks. I think it's an interesting way to rethink about how we categorize mental illnesses. Clearly, the taxonomy of these psychiatric illnesses, we know that DSM is not perfect, ICD is not perfect, but I think if we begin to have enough longitudinal data on people, we can certainly look at what are people more likely to transition to, what are high-risk states. So I think there's just interesting aspects of this. I'll conclude what I think is one of actually the most interesting part is we can use the same paradigm that we talked about, but we can actually say, do a telepsychiatry visit with my patients with schizophrenia. I can have a digital navigator, one of my kind of clinical assistants, ask the patient and work with them to set up surveys for that person on the phone, set up sensors if we want and give them smartphone interventions, have that digital navigator system kind of help the patient use the smartphone to collect data, do interventions and then come back to a clinical visit and we can talk about 
what they did out of session in terms of what their data looked like in intervention. So the same paradigm that lets us do interesting research can also be used to customize care and augment digital care today. So I think it's a nice way to really have translational research that benefits all sides of the clinical continuum. The, it's tricky sometimes to work with this data, sometimes accelerometer on smartphones. We all know smartphones are different. Some work very well. This is day one to 105 for one person. This is 092. Sometimes we have gaps in data. Sometimes the data is messier. Apple seems like they're going to come out with new something called sensor kit that may offer better data through iPhones. It's hard to access this right now, but I think the world is certainly changing and who gives us control of the data and what it is. So there may be some changes on the horizon. Engagement is very difficult. This is an interesting review paper of mobile health research across different fields, including one in depression. But the point being, it's very tricky to keep people engaged with this data collection. So we have to think about that as a challenge. And I think certainly we've all heard about sensors and wearables. There's more and more of them coming out, which may be one alternative to some of these engagement challenges. The last slide I'll say is we have a website, mindapps.org. It's also completely free where we just index different mental health apps. If anyone's interested or adding mental health apps are interesting, more for clinical purposes, let me know and I'll end on that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Torres, for this really novel approach of behavioral research. And we're going to continue with Dr. Eva Friedl. Thank you, Dominic, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the great talk, Professor Toro. I'm happy to talk about learning and decision making in alcohol use disorder. So I'm going to go a bit more away from the psychosis to the uh, AUD part. And here, I'd really like to start with a rather simple question. So what is an addiction, actually? And when you have the simple questions, you start consulting Google first. And here, you get quite a wide variety of definitions. So you can see here dependency, dependence, craving, but also habit weakness, compulsion, and even fixation and enslavement. So when you look at this really bright variety of definitions, it, this goes back to an old controversy about what addiction really is. Is it a treatable disorder with a biological correlate or is it rather a weakness of willpower? People just don't want to get abstinent because they maybe enjoy that drink. They drink, they just don't want it enough. And when you then look at the consequences of an addiction, it's really hard to understand why people actually do continue to consume alcohol. It has a severe uh, consequence for mental and physical health. And my patients tell me that they don't experience their drinks as as hedonic or enjoyable, even more repulsive. They lose work relationships, social and romantic relationship. And in the end, we have quite sophisticated treatment programs already with psycho psychotherapy, um, also long rehabilitation, um, physical withdrawal. And still we have these really high relapse rates of up to 70%. So why do we not succeed in helping these patients in remaining abstinent? And one approach to, um, to, to go here in order to understand the development and the maintenance of this disorder is to compare the decision-making process. And here we have a dual com control approach. Valerie Woon um, talked about this earlier in her talk as well. Uh, between a habitual and a goal-directed uh, decision-making system. We need both of them and they are coexistent. The habitual one is rather, flex rather fast, autom automatic responses, inflexible. So when you take your way to work every morning, you would go the same direction without thinking about it. So it's computationally non-demanding. But sometimes you would have these so-called slips of actions. When you, for example, on the weekend, go the same direction, you would go to work but um, find yourself on the wrong way. And that's when you actually would need the goal-directed system. You would need to have an internal representation of all the possible um, actions, all the possible crossings and directions you can take. And this is computationally more demanding. And one idea is that in, in alcohol use disorder, you would have um, a gradual shift from the goal-directed to the habitual responding. So the, the, the patients go from a, previously hedonic drink that they consciously decide to take 
to a more habitual drinking where the drinking itself is no longer rewarding, but because they've done it so much before, they would continue. And the evidence for this shift from the goal-directed to the habitual learning comes from mainly comes from animal research. And here's some, some famous work has been performed by Anthony Dickens, who uh, on the left-hand panel, as you see here, he trained rats to press a lever in order to obtain an alcohol shot. And then in the next step, he would devaluate this alcohol shot. So he would pair the alcohol infusion with the stick-making infusion so the red can no longer really enjoy this alcohol. It's no longer rewarding. So it's devalued. And then in the last step, you would assess whether the, um, the red would still approach the lever to press to obtain the alcohol. And this actually happens with the alcohol. So there seems to a propensity here to, to, to show a more habitual responding, which is not the case with other rewards. For example, food rewards don't show that much habitual responding. Also on a biological level, what we see is a, a corrupted dopamine system within the limbic parts. Uh, we've heard about them, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral striatum. And also on the behavioral level, what we can see is a certain um, prevalence for conditioned stimuli in our habitual animals. So on the right-hand side, you can see two types of rats, so-called sign tracking and goal tracking rats. And the sign checking red would pay much more attention to the condition stimulus here, the lever, it's licking the lever, um, as opposed to the goal checking red that, um, that goes to the food palate in the middle. And there's also a genetic basis for this difference in prevalence for condition cues as opposed to rewards. So the big challenge here was to actually translate this evidence from animal research for habitual responding to humans and alcohol dependent patients. And here we use the so-called Pavlovian to instrumental transfer paradigm that combines classical Pavlovian conditioning and, conditioning and instrumental learning. So let me briefly guide you through the paradigm. What we do is we first teach our subjects instru um, and instrumental learning. And here you have shells with different colors and shapes. Here's a yellow one, but there were blue ones. They all look different. And subjects had to learn um, to collect good shells, which were paired with a, with a money reward, and to leave the bad shells. And we assessed this via the button presses. So the, the more they pressed to collect, the better they learned. And we made sure everybody learned the good and the bad shells. Then there's a Pavlovian conditioning phase where we pair a neutral stimulus with a money reward, here a fractal, or the loss of a money, so it becomes positive or negative. And we, all, we use the natural already conditioned cues of alcohol pictures. And here subjects could choose their favorite drink between beer, wine, and a hard drink. And now the interesting part is really to look at the influence that the background Pavlovian conditioned cues have on your instrumental choice. So we do assess whether um, the collection of the shells is influenced by the background pictures and if this is different between our patients and our control subjects. And indeed, when we compare the behavioral effect, we do find a much stronger fit effect in AUD patients compared to the healthy controls. You can see that here um, on, the, on the left side, on the slope of the straight. So you see on the x-axis the value of the background picture and on the y-axis the number of button presses as a function of the pit effect. And here the AUD patients are much more influenced by the background picture in their choice, in their instrumental choice, than the, um, than the healthy controls. And on a neural level, we see um, a correlate um, in the nucleus accumbens in the AUD patients for the, for the um, magnitude of the pit effect. So the more the patients were influenced in their choice by the background picture, the more activation we actually found in the nucleus accumbens. We then divided our patients into relapsing and abstaining patients. So in our study, we followed the patients actually for one year, but here you can see the data after three months. And interestingly, our, our um, neural effect was driven by the relapsing patients. So those who didn't remain abstinent show the strongest neural correlate of the PIT and also the strongest PIT effect, actually. 
Then the next analysis was um, what you what you've seen before was the money pit. So the the um, influence of the natural cues that have been paired with the money. Now next we analyze the so-called alcohol pit. So we check whether the instrumental choice is influenced by the alcohol background picture differently in the healthy controls and in the AUD patients. And here on the bottom, you can see the choice of the three favorite drinks. Every subject choose one. And on the right side is the uh, neutral um, water stimulus. So again, now a bit in another direction than we would have expected, we found a stronger pit effect again in the AUD patients, which is what we would have expected. But what was a bit the other way around is the value of the alcohol versus water picture um, cues. So the alcohol actually had a negative balance, so it suppressed the instrumental action, whereas the water stimulus was neutral but had a positive um, condition value. And when you look at this difference with respect to the neural pit effect and with, with respect to the disease severity, we can see that in this case, it was actually the abstaining patients who showed the stronger PIT effect and the stronger neural response. So they, um, they succeeded in giving alcohol a negative value and water a positive one and thus suppressed the instrumental action much more than the, the relapsing ones. So here maybe we, we find the first step towards some kind of re resilience factor or some kind of factor that influences not only the maintenance, but also the development of um, alcohol use disorder and the way that you, you are able to give value to condition stimulus and that, that you react to the condition stimuli. So the last point that I would, would like to mention with respect to our data here was the question whether um, in the development of AUD, there's also a propensity to, to react to PIT. Um, to, to answer this question, we analyzed data from healthy control subjects. So we took uh, subjects from the birth register, male 18 year olds, and divided them into high risk and low risk drinkers. A high risk drinker would consume more than 60 gram alcohol, which is about five drinks on one occasion. And then assessed whether we do have a difference in the pit effect between these healthy control subjects. And again, we do find a difference. And in this case, as we expected, the high risk drinkers would show a stronger pit effect with a neural correlate this time in the amygdala. And uh, with this study, we also assessed a polygenic risk score. So a risk score that is able with a multitude of sites on the gene to divide between um, AUD patients and control subjects. And we took this risk score and correlated it with our behavioral PIT effect. And we found a moderate um, correlation here. So when I go back to the sign checking and goal tracking animals, maybe this is quite similar that we also have a genetic basis in our condition responding in, in our um, interference with the instrumental response or the decision-making process that we, that we perform afterwards. So let me conclude here. Um, the, the PIT effect, so Pavlovian to instrumental transfer, seems to be an important part, both of the development, but also of the maintenance of alcohol use disorder. Of course, we don't know if the alcohol consumption itself also has an effect on, on this development, but probably there's, all, there's a predisposition before already. And the neurocorrelates were different within our study, so there seems to be, it seems to be important whether it's developing like in the 18 year old where we have the amygdala, uh, which is also emo important for emotion regulation, and then um, a shift towards the more reward um, dependent areas like the nucleus accumbens and the ventral striatum. So when I go back to my initial question, what is an addiction and, and why does it actually continue? I would um, suppose that there is actually a tendency, a propensity or predisposition to, to react to condition cues and to also condition these cues. 
And this might also be relevant for surroundings or even for emotional states that were prevalent when, when the subjects consumed in order to, to condition these, these cues and surroundings. And the big challenge will be to, to, to make interventions in order to prevent this shift from the habitual, uh, from the goal-directed to the habitual use and to go back to a more occasional use. And this can happen by a more cognitive control because we have shown that less cognitive control and less fluid IQ um, promotes habit learning. Um, on the other hand, the, a reduction of stress, for example, leads to more uh, goal-directed responding. So these different systems to, to, to actually address these different systems in an experimental setting will be the next big challenge of our uh, research group. And um, here I would like to stop and thank you all for listening and thank my mentors, uh, Professor Walter and Professor Heinz, but obviously also a really, really big thank to the BIH Clinician Scientist Program. None of this would have happened without, without this program. And I was really happy to, to have the opportunity to also get to know um, Professor Dragoon, who was very supportive and really impressive and really kind in her way of supporting. But also uh, Natalie Huber and Ivan Maic have been really important figures in my in my way here through the program. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Eva, so much for this really elegant body of work that uh, combines imaging data, epigenetics, and clinical data. Um, so I would like to open the joint discussion. We have approximately five minutes time out of ten minutes that we planned, so it's going to be a little bit shorter. Um, so I want to invite the audience to post questions in the chat um, and I would uh, like to uh, open with the first question to uh, both of you, uh, Professor Torres and Eva. So thank you for your interesting talks. A quick question for Eva. Does it matter what substance one is addicted to for your PIT to work? Is it different for more GABAergic substances? Yeah, that's a really, really good uh, question because there is definitely a, um, a difference in the kind of substance. There have been quite a broad variety of, of research on it, so on cocaine, also on heroin, and there is difference. So um, the GABA allergic subjects uh, substances do seem to work differently, but there is research on animals with lesions also within the GABA allergic systems that enhance PIT. So both seem, seem to be influenced. So, so there is a correlate between the behavioral pit and also the GABAergic substances, but it's different and they use different paradigms. And I don't know of a study that did um, the pit procedure in, in, in humans with the GABAergic substances yet, actually. Thank you so much for your answer. And I also have one question for Professor Torres. So I found it really uh, compelling to um, have a device or a paradigm that I can give patients to take home and to collect data in the naturalistic environment as opposed to um, collecting data in the lab. So I wondered how do older adults operate um, those devices? What is your experience from older adults who might have more problems um, operating um, apps and other research devices on their phones? So it, it's a wonderful question and two parts. If we're collecting more of the sensor passive data and we don't need active engagement, generally that will work well across age groups. What we found, and even I went through a quick that review of over 100,000 individuals in these smartphone studies, actually older adults have higher rates of engagement with, with smartphone research. I think in part being younger adults may get notifications or just may not delete the app, but they have so many apps that's commonplace, where sometimes for older adults, they actually engage more and follow directions and keep things working. Certainly, there'll be a class of older adults where it won't work for, it'll be a class of younger adults where it won't work for, but we, we actually have better luck with older adults, which is not what we thought when we started this either. Oh, thank you so much. Um, that's uh, surprising, and I, I'm very happy to hear that. So um, I would like to continue and to um, go on with our third tandem couple today. So please let me introduce Professor 
Sarah Kittel-Schneider, who is a professor for developmental psychiatry, and she's also vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry, Psychosomatics and Psychotherapy at the University Hospital in Würzburg, Germany. Professor Kittel-Schneider's research focuses on the neurobiological mechanisms and therapeutic approaches of a variety of psychiatric illnesses, including attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and bipolar disorder. She's also the chair of the Macrae Society, a society that supports postpartum mental health. And I would like really to take this opportunity now to thank Professor Kittel Schneider because um, she agreed and accepted our short notice invitation to come to the symposium um, after another of our speaker, Dr. Ned Kalin, unfortunately was not able to attend. So thank you very much. Professor Kittel Schneider will be joined today by Dr. An Bin Cho, a junior fellow of the BIH Charité Clinician Scientist Program in the Department of Psychiatry at Charité Campus Benjamin Franklin. So we're very much looking forward to the talks. Dr. Cho's current research focuses on understanding the role of the oxytocin system in symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So please welcome our speakers, Professor Kittel Schneider and Dr. Cho. So thank you very much. Everybody can hear and see me. Then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here on short notice, but nevertheless, it's a really um, interesting and high quality um, uh, conference you got there. So um, now I want to talk a bit uh, about um, one yeah, main uh, research focus of mine, and this is um, human derived neuronal cell models in ADHD. So this is my conflicts of interest. And then just to give you a short overview, because not everybody might be familiar with wh why we are um, trying to do research on human induced pluripotent stem cells and how is uh, that done. So we have um, patients or healthy controls, and in our case, we take skin punches, and then we uh, grow fibroblast cultures, which can um, then be reprogrammed using the Yamanaka factors into human induced pluripotent stem cells. And, and those human induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPSI, can be differentiated in nearly um, every somatic cell type because we are interested in mental disorders, and mental disorders are disorders of the brain. We uh, mainly focus on um, differentiation into neuronal cells, but also glial cells are important and, and uh, possible to do. And what you, can you do with those uh, neuronal or CNS cell models uh, derived from patients and controls? You can functionally characterize as Eurystein variants and their cellular functions. You can also identify subtypes of the disorders and um, they could really prove useful in investigating mechanisms of response and non-response to especially to medication treatment. And last but not least, we hope that in the future, those patient-derived cell models could be used as high-throughput um, screening tools to um, find novel treatments or, um, on the way to personalized or precision medicine. Um, just a few, few words about um, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, as you may know, ADHD is the most um, prevalent neurodevelopmental disorder in childhood and adolescence. Worldwide, about four to seven children and adolescents suffer from it. And in about 50 cases, in 50% of the cases, it persists into adulthood. Um, so we have a worldwide prevalence of about two to four percent of the adults suffering from ADHD. The core symptoms are inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, but there are also additional symptoms, especially in the adults, like emotional dysregulation, disorganization, cognitive symptoms like mind wandering, which is associated with the inattention, and circadian disturbances. So most of the ADHD um, patients have severe sleep problems, for example. Also, we like long know that ADHD people have an increased risk of co-occurring mental diseases. For example, autism spectrum disorder in children or a positional defiant disorder and conduct disorder in the children and adolescents. And then um, they are um, of high risk of developing affective disorders or substance abuse disorders 
in, in adolescence and adulthood. And in the, in the last years, there's a lot of um, research um, on also co-occurring somatic diseases in ADHD, like for example, asthma or obesity, and then following diabetes mellitus, as well as migraine and epilepsies. So ADHD is one of the most heritable um, mental disorders. So the heritability estimates from twin studies um, estimating yeah, 70 to 80% heritability. And in the search for risk gene variants or the underlying genetic um, factors for ADHD in the last genome-wide um, association study or meta-analysis of genome-wide association studies, including now about 20,000 individuals with ADHD and uh, 35,000 controls. And we found about 12 loci that are associated with ADHD. And as you can see uh, in the lower table, there are a lot of genes um, in, in between those um, 12 loci. And um, here, uh, those are the more common variants associated with ADHD, contributing only to a small effect uh, of the disease risk. But there are also, um, for example, single families um, that show more rare variants, like for example, copy number variants that are associated with ADHD risk. And there are even mutations or um, more uh, rare variants with, uh, with bigger effects or greater effects on the ADHD risk in, in uh, single families or single individuals. But it's not all about genes. Um, ADHD is said to be caused by gene environment de development, uh, development interaction. So there are a lot of preperinatal and postnatal risk factors that have been associated also with the risk of developing ADHD. For example, if the mother has a lot of psychosocial stress during the pregnancy, if the mother is taking illegal drugs, for example, like cannabis, cannabinoids, and then over the counter drugs as paracetamol uh, is suggested to increase the ADHD risk in, in the children, um, as well as prescription drugs like Valproate. And then also birth complications. Um, here, uh, preterm birth is a really consistently um, replicated risk factor for developing ADHD in the children, as well as um, child maltreatment in early infancy. So, but now how, how can we model that um, with uh, cell models? So I think it's clear that uh, regarding the genetic factors, we can take um, the, the skin punches and generate cell lines from ADHD patients with certain risk gene variants, and then um, see what those risk gene variants on the cellular level contribute to the risk of uh, or disease mechanisms, risk of disorder. But with the environmental factors, it is a bit more complicated. But we still think we could model, model, at least model, the effects of the environmental risk factors, for example, by using nutrient deprivation as, for example, modeling low birth weight or hypoxia, modeling uh, birth complications as well. You can, for sure, treat the cells in vitro with nicotine, alcohol, different medication. And to investigate more specific cell functions, for example, mitochondrial function, you can also use specific harmful agents um, blocking, for example, mitochondrial functions in the cells in vitro, like CCCP or FCCP. Um, with regards to ADHD, um, there are only very few studies um, published yet uh, about IPC and um, no, no study besides our own about neuronal cells derived from ADHD patients. Um, so here you can see most of the publications just tell that they have generated IPCs using different uh, kinds of um, uh, donor cells, urine, blood, or uh, fibroblasts as we did, but no functional results yet uh, besides our own results, which I will uh, talk about in a minute. So. We decided to um, choose a more rare genetic variant associated with ADHD um, for our first project um, because we thought that the impact on the cellular phenotype uh, should be more pronounced in a more rare variant um, in, in com compared with the 
um, uh, single nuclear polymerases and third, the uh, common variants. So an increase in the overall burden of copy number variants have been previously shown and to be uh, associated in children, adolescents, and adult ADHD populations. And a previous study has then also um, uh, shown that ACNVs in the PAC2 genetic locus um, could be candidate genes um, in ADHD. As you might know, mutations in the PAC2 gene are the most common cause of familial Parkinson's um, disorder or the disease. And the coded protein in Parkin, um, together with PINK1, plays an important role in the regulation of the mitochondria quality control. This um, has been known before. And then coming back to ADHD, um, this is also interesting because mitochondrial dysfunctions and energy metabolism disturbances have been reported before in a not IPC-derived cell model, in a so-called cybrid cell model of ADHD to be present. And also mitochondrial dysfunction and um, yeah, disturbed a reaction to, um, to oxidative stress has also been reported to an, an ADHD population before. So we um, re-recruited the patients from that previous study. And we, in the first project, we could get fibroblast and then IPC lines from two deletion and one duplication carrier with ADHD. And um, we compared those um, to, with uh, wild-type carriers with also suffering from ADHD and to wild-type carriers um, that are healthy controls. And um, from one deletion, one duplication, and one health type a wild type healthy control, we also differentiated dopaminergic neuronal cells. And what you need to do then is um, because of in, in the technique of the reprogramming of the fibroblast into IPC and then further differentiation, you can insert um, new mutations or chromosomal aberrations in the cell lines. So you need to check that the um, genetic background, the genetic profile is uh, the same um, as it is in the donor. And this we did here on the left side. So we checked that in the duplication um, carrier, the duplication in the PAC2 locus is um, still there. We checked for the deletion and in the uh, wild type healthy control, you see a flat line. So um, uh, the cell lines didn't uh, lose their uh, genetic profile and uh, didn't uh, um, get new mutations or aberrations. Um, this is what it looks like. We have the fibroblast, and then we reprogram them. We are using the Zendai virus, and then you get early IPC clones. You need to pick them manually, and then you need to take them further um, and maintain them and yeah, grow them for a while. And then you need to check as a quality control um, that those IPC lines um, express pluripotency factors here, brought the immunostaining pictures. Um, but we also check that with PCR. And then you need to show that those IPC lines are um, able to differentiate spontaneously into the three germ layers, um, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, which is shown here in the immunostaining pictures of the embryoid body assays uh, quite nicely. So after showing that we have so-called bona fide IPSCs that are truly pluripotent, and we differentiate them into dopamine, dopaminergic neuronal cells and up to day 50, which are there, yeah, mature enough also to do functional studies. And then we also needed to show that those uh, dopaminergic neuronal cells express uh, the dopaminergic markers like the TH and TAP3, the immunostaining, and we could also prove uh, using a LISA assay that um, our dopaminergic neuronal cells um, can produce dopamine. There was no difference in the dopamine concentration intra and extracellular between the wild types and the deletion and duplication carriers. And what we didn't do in our first um, uh, study um, is to test the electrophysiological function, which is also important to show that those neurons are really functional. They, um, we did show that they produce uh, dopamine, but you also need to show that they are able to um, generate an action potential. However, and now in the next project, we differentiated the same cell lines into cortical neurons. And here you can see that we have um, truly 
um, electrophysiological functional cortical neurons, they are able to generate action potentials. And here is a healthy control, wild type cell line and a deletion carrier with ADHD. And it looks also like the electrophysiological function differs between the two cell lines, but this is only the first results and we need to test all the cell lines and compare them. them. And what we did in the first project, which is already published now, is that we um, looked for parkin gene and protein expression. And here we could show as well in the fibroblast as in the dopaminergic neuronal cells, that as well the deletion as the duplication carriers show lower PAC2 gene and protein expression and compared with the wild type healthy control that was true in the baseline and starvation condition in the fibroblast and also in the dopaminergic neuronal cells. Only the CCCP um, didn't so much um, uh, affect uh, um, the uh, protein or uh, gene expression. And then we got, had the hypothesis that they might have a mitochondrial function and an energy um, metabolism problem. So we looked at the ATP level. And here and we could also show that ATP concentration, as well in fibroblast as in dopaminergic neuronal cells, was decreased in the deletion and duplication carriers compared with wild type controls. And as well, the oxygen consumption rate um, here shown in the fibroblast was um, reduced in the deletion and the duplication carrier as well in baseline, this is A and D, as in um, nutrient deprivation condition, this is B and E. And only the CCCP treatment did not really affect um, the fibroblast differently, um, which also could be a methodological problem. Um, and here also in the dopaminergic neuronal cells, you can see that the wild type healthy controls have a higher oxygen consumption rate and compared to the PAC2 duplication and deletion carriers uh, suffering from ADHD as well in the baseline as in the uh, nutrient deprivation, which is the picture B. And um, also the CCCP here, now you, you can see an effect on the dopaminergic neuronal cells. But in all three conditions, um, the cell lines from the PAC2, CNV, duplication and the deletion carriers show lower oxygen consumption rate. So what, what could be behind those, those first findings we have here. So nearly 20 years ago, there was a review article published um, um, with a hypothesis if ADHD could be an energy deficiency syndrome, which I find really interesting. But 20 years ago, they didn't have all the um, technical um, possibilities we have now to, to investigate these questions, I know, I think. And um, for example, also that, that mind wandering symptom a lot of the ADHD people have um, is on the on the functional level. It's the, the hypothesis is that it might maybe that um, the the patients in the brain can sustain like a um, continuously good energy balance and metabolism and therefore their brain um, intermittently can't is not able to focus on tasks and um, like switches back to a resting state, even if the patients um, uh, don't intend that. So this this could be a bit um, um, explain what we saw on the cellular level. This could be the um, the consequences of what we saw on the cellular level. And another really interesting publication from 2006 um, talked about the hypothesis if ADHD could be also due to a deficient uh, astrocyte function. So this is also really interesting because the astrocytes, we didn't um, uh, investigate this so far, but the astrocytes also play a role in the maintenance um, of the energy level of the neuronal cells. And if the astrocytes um, don't uh, function um, or dysfunction, then the neurons can also have a problem with 
energy metabolism. So what we want to do now is that we want to confirm our findings from the dopaminergic cells in a more general and also um, yeah, ADHD, maybe more relevant to ADHD uh, neuronal model in cortical neurons. We um, are adding additional biological replicates because we have also one more duplication carrier and some more controls. We want to confirm and clarify our results using seahorse assay, which is uh, more um, it's better to, to go deeper into that suggested mitochondrial function. And it's, it would be also really interesting to co-culture our neural cells with glial cells. And just a future perspective, because um, one point of criticism on our 2D cell models is that the brain is not just one cell type or not 2D, it's much more complex, but there are also other groups working on brain organoids from ADHD patients in here. I brought a poster from a recent conference um, where the, this, uh, one of those groups are showing uh, the first generation of cortical organoids from ADHD and also the first um, results um, they have there. So this is, um, I think, what, what we will also do in the future. But uh, I think we need first to understand it in 2D and then we can go for the much more complex 3D models. So with this, I'm at the end. I want to thank you, thank my former Frankfurt group, um, uh, also Viola Stella Palladino, who did her PhD thesis and did um, most of the work on the PARC2 dopaminergic neuronal cells, and my working group in uh, Würzburg now, and then also to all our collaborators helping with those very complex uh, projects. And questions, I think we can take after that. Thank you, Professor Kittelschneider, for this really, full, really beautiful example for translational research. Um, we're going to um, summarize questions uh, at the end of our next talk. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we also got a few more questions from our talks before. So I want to invite Professor Torres uh, and Eva as well to stay in the line uh, if we have time so we can dis discuss a little bit after Dr. Cho's talk. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, so um, thank you for your kind of introduction, uh, Dominic, and thank you for having me here. And thank you, Professor Kitoshnada, for your fascinating talk. I find it really fascinating, this new point of view that ADHD may be an uh, energy uh, deficiency um, disorder. And uh, with the um, deficiency in ATP, so I will definitely come up with follow-up questions uh, per email. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Anbin Chu, and I'm a psychiatric resident at Charité Campus Benjamin Franklin and um, also a junior clinician scientist. And I will be talking to you about the impact of oxytocin system on intrusive symptoms after trauma film paradigm, which may be a feasible model to study PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I will just walk you through my slides. I will first talk about the post-traumatic stress disorder, and then I will talk about the um, social salience hypothesis, um, uh, specifically um, of, the of the oxytocin system. And then I will introduce you to two studies, one of which um, has already been done in our research group, and uh, the second study is my junior clinician scientist project. And uh, with these two studies, I will talk about the impact of oxytocin and intrusion formation, and specifically after trauma from paradigm. So in countries of the EU, every third woman and every sixth man falls victim to physical and or sexual assault. And um, every fourth traumatized individual develops a post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. In Germany, there's a lifetime prevalence of PTSD of approximately 3%. Um, however, 60, up to 60% of the individuals with PTSD do not respond to first-line treatment with um, SSRIs, which are selective um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, a type of antidepressant. And um, there's a high dropout rate in the prolonged exposure therapy, which is a psychotherapy with um, high distress um, in the initial sessions. And unfortunately, there's only limited uh, preventive methods available. So the post-traumatic stress disorder is characterized by uh, um, distinct or distinct, uh, several distinct traumatic events, um, followed by intrusion symptoms, to which I will come back later, avoidance of, um, um, of uh, things that resemble the traumatic event, negative cognitions and mood related to the traumatic event, hyperarousal, and these symptoms have to last for at least a month and lead to a um, significant loss of function and not be better explained by a different psychiatric um, diagnosis. 
So intrusion symptoms are a core uh, symptom of the PTSD. And um, they can be described as recurrent involuntary and distressing memories or um, dreams, or so nightmares of the traumatic event. And um, there are also dissociative reactions, also called flashbacks, in which the individual feels or acts as if um, the traumatic event was reoccurring, uh, recurring, um, or intense or prolonged psychological distress or physiological reactions to cues that resemble the traumatic event. So the biological background of these intrusive symptoms is not really fully understood. And um, in previous studies, um, they have been enhanced intrusive symptoms and enhanced adrenergic activity. So um, high um, levels of salivary alpha amylase um, was positively correlated with greater intrusive symptoms. And a dysregulation in, of the stress axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, was also um, positively correlated with enhanced intrusive symptoms. And um, when uh, and a, a lower heart rate variability at baseline in veterans' uh, pre-deployment was um, positively associated with um, enhanced intrusive symptoms post-deployment. So the, ox the oxytocin neuropeptide seems to play an essential role in um, the intrusion formation or um, at least in the stress regulation. And the initial, um, evi initial evidence points at uh, what I would um, call as positive effects of oxytocin, so anxiolytic effects. Uh, with the regulation of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis with the reduced cortisol um, levels after exposure to stress, uh, when um, exogenously um, ox oxytocin was applied, or um, a lower activity of amygdala in response to stress, and a better connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, which is essential for stress regulation and fear extinction. However, newer evidence is now pointing at what I would now f call as negative effects of oxytocin, so anxiogenic effects, with greater um, stress reactivity to negative stimuli um, in the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, and essentially in uh, females, a higher amygdala activity in response to negative stimuli. So uh, these contrasting results can be best summed up um, with the silence hypothesis. So the silence hypothesis is a, thesis, um, is a hypothesis in psychology, which states that um, our, um, our perception um, that we perceive some uh, stimuli more readily than other stimuli. And um, in the oxytocin system uh, with the social salience hypothesis, um, it states that the oxytocin modulates the salience of external contextual social cues or safety signals. So basic basically, if you're feeling um, fearful and anxious and you're in a negative context and you apply oxytocin, then you uh, more readily perceive these negative cues um, and um, these are amplified, and when you're in a positive context and you're happy um, and you apply oxytocin, then these positive context is then amplified. So the question that arises is, uh, what is the impact of exogenic um, increased level of oxytocin on the number of intrusive symptoms during the acquisition or consolidation of a traumatic event? And um, the acquisition is the first stage of memory formation followed by consolidation, and the memory can then either be forgotten or maintained. So there's um, only scarce uh, preliminary evidence available to answer this question. And there was a small study with only 18 participants uh, which showed that a single dosage of um, exogenous um, oxytocin reduced the number of intrusive symptoms in patients with PTSD. And when you apply oxytocin six months after a traumatic event, um, you have less intrusive symptoms. In a different study, they applied um, oxytocin for six days um, in a series um, before and after the a traumatic event. Um, and these data um, cannot really sufficiently answer our research questions since the moment of the intrusion formation, the context during the oxytocin intake um, to test the salience hypothesis is not really or not really controlled. So our hypothesis is um, the intake of intranasal oxytocin in a negative context during the acquisition or consolidation of a traumatic event will lead to an increase in the number of intrusive symptoms. And with a negative context, uh, we mean um, the um, acquisition and the consolidation of a traumatic event. So um, as I already said, I would like to talk to you about uh, two studies. Uh, these were two experimental randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled studies. And the primary um, outcome variable and the um, secondary outcome variables were the same, so number of intrusive, sim intrusive symptoms in the following four days after the analog trauma, which I will explain later. 
And we also tested for the noradrenergic activity, heart rate variability, and uh, saliva cortisol for the HPA activity, psychometric data, and the impact of the genetic polymorphism of the oxytocin system, as well as the polygenic risk score uh, for PTSD, but also for major depressive uh, disorder um, on the, on the oxy oxytocin effect. And uh, recruited for each of the study were 220 healthy females between the ages 18 and 45. And we excluded um, persons with a psychiatric and somatic comorbidity, experience of sexual abuse, intake of uh, medication, pregnancy and lactation. And we also did a pregnancy test to ensure that no one was pregnant during the, during the study. So we used a trauma film paradigm, um, and I will come back to that later as well. And we had two studies, um, one um, with a single intake of synthetic intranasal oxytocin uh, before the film sequence, and one after the film sequence. And for the statistical analysis, we used generalized mixed linear models for Poisson distributed data, oxytocin versus placebo, and cross-validated regular regularized uh, regression models to assess uh, relevant covariables. So the trauma film paradigm is an established um, trauma uh, film paradigm. To um, it's a use of stressful film sequence to, as an analog trauma to induce short-lasting intrusive symptoms um, um, in healthy individuals. And uh, what we use um, has already uh, been established as well. It's a sequence of the French commercial film called um, Irreversible by Gaspar Noé, 2002. Um, and it is basically a scene where a uh, woman uh, is being uh, physically um, attacked and, um, and abused and sexually assaulted um, in a pedestrian subway. And this has consistently elicited a higher heart rate, um, distress, and intrusive memories. And the use of this film sequence has already been validated in um, several research groups and its safety has been proven. So um, the intrusive symptoms never last for longer than seven days. We do a follow up for that. So um, as I already said, healthy females between the ages 18 and 45, um, 220, uh, were um, uh, randomized into an oxytocin or placebo arm. And um, for the first study, which has already been done in our research group, um, the, oxytoc the oxytocin uh, was applied right before the tra trauma film sequence. And the primary endpoint was the number of intrusions in the following four days, which um, um, happened as a self-reported um, e-diary. And um, this was the work from Katharina Schulte-Praus, who is now associate professor in Colombia. And um, I can present to you the data right here. Um, so the oxytocin intake before the analog trauma increased the number of intrusive symptoms compared to placebo. Um, so our conclusions from this study is that oxytocin does seem to amplify intrusive symptoms during the acquisition and consolidation when given before the analog trauma. And this is in concordance with the salience hypothesis. So it's a negative context while the oxytocin is working and you're watching this um, trauma film paradigm. But the question that arises from this data is, uh, will a non-negative context, so a neutral setting when they're done watching this uh, film sequence while applying exogenous oxytocin lead to a reduction in intrusive symptoms after analog trauma? And here we can also differentiate between acquisition versus consolidation because we will now look at consolidation. And the hypo hypothesis is that the intake of intranasal oxytocin in a non-negative context during consolidation of an analog trauma will lead to a reduction in the number of intrusive symptoms. And um, the oxytocin was now applied after the film sequence. So um, despite the two lockdowns and clinical studies, we have um, finished recruiting and testing 220 um, uh, um, healthy females um, randomized into an oxytocin and placebo arm and now doing the data analysis. And um, the difference to the first study is um, that we are now, uh, that we have now applied oxytocin right uh, um, uh, 40 minutes after the trauma film uh, sequence and, and now I'm also looking at the number of intrusions in the following four days via e-diary. So what I could imagine as a future outlook is, are there possible implications for the ter therapeutic use of oxytocin in a non-negative context in the treatment of intrusive symptoms in individuals with PTSD? 
So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, express my sincere uh, gratitude to uh, Professor Dragoon and uh, the people of BIH, and um, also and um, to my scientific and my clinical mentors, obviously Professor Stefan Röpke, Professor Katja Wingfeld, Professor Christian Otze, and last but not least, um, Chair of the Department, and also my clinical mentor, Professor Isabella Häuser, and um, thank you for inviting me today. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful talk and those mechanistic data. Um, so I would like to um, open the joint discussion. And as I mentioned before, we do have some uh, further questions for earlier speakers. Um, so please feel free to also add more questions in the chat function and I'll read them out loud for you. So I would like um, to start the discussion by asking uh, Professor Kittel Schneider, who uh, really added um, a nice topic to our meeting today. Uh, we were talking about basal ganglia earlier. We we're talking about Parkinson's disease. Um, you now contributed by talking um, about uh, ADHD. So I've been aware there has been a discussion that ADHD might be a risk factor to prospectively develop Parkinson's disease. So I wonder what your perspective is on um, these, relationship, uh, these relationships and how your data contribute to understanding them. Yeah, I mean, our, in our sample, we have also investigated the ADHD patients. I took the, f the skin punches from um, for um, early signs of Parkinson's um, disease with sniffing sticks and also with the neurological um, yeah, in, uh, extermination. We couldn't find that, but um, there were, I think the oldest uh, was uh, at sampling uh, point was about 50 ish. So we, we don't know yet if, if they uh, could develop uh, Parkinson's um, disease later in life. Um, there are there's very, very few research about ADHD, about elderly ADHD people and what kind of neurodegenerative disorders they might develop later in life. But there are few hints that they could be um, on at increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, maybe also um, Parkinson's um, disease or Parkinson's syndromes. But we, we don't know. Uh, yet, but it could be. On the other hand, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental and not a neurodegenerative disorder. So, I mean, from our first results, we think that there is a more like functional problem and the, the unstable function of the cells, and we don't see neurodegeneration. But as I said, there are first hints that those people could also be at risk for neurodegeneration later in life, but the studies are really missing so far. Thank you so much for answering this question. Um, so I also have a question for Dr. Cho, um, who showed her data on oxytocin and intrusive um, memories or intrusive um, perception. Um, so I saw that your data were exclusively based on females. And I wondered, um, uh, are you also planning to look at males? Um, what is the rationale behind to look only at females? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so we decided to look at healthy, uh, healthy females only because there is a gender difference of the oxytocin um, effect. Um, so um, I think it was my third slide, so it showed that um, there was a hi um, heightened amygdala activity in response to negative stimuli in females only um, compared to males. And um, the uh, prevalence um, for the PTSD is um, just higher for um, females um, compared to males. So there's a sex difference of female to male of about two, and two or three to one. And uh, we decided to use um, the film sequence with a sexual um, assault scene, and um, there's um, just a higher prevalence of females experiencing sexual violence, and this is also uh, the um, index trauma, which um, uh, most likely um, leads to uh, PTSD. So that was the rationale behind that. But it's an excellent question um, w whether we uh, want to test uh, the same um, hypothesis with male as well. That's, um, I think, a future outlook. Uh, worth looking into. Thank you so much. So I would like to uh, read a few of the questions from the audience. Uh, so first I have a question um, for um, John. Um, so the question is, my question to John, whether at the current stage 
one can say whether self-report or passive data is a better predictor for relevant clinical outcomes, like relapse in psychiatry? It's a good question. I think at this point, the variance in passive data is close to being clinically useful. What's tricky about a lot of the mobile and smartphone research is most of it has not been replicated because a lot of it's done on custom systems where it's impossible to replicate or other groups to do it. So I think we haven't yet seen clinical research and clinical neuroscience advance as quickly because we're all using different systems, different standards, different measurements. So I imagine that in 12 months, we'll have a better answer to that question as we actually see some replication efforts in, in the field. Thank you. Then I have a question for Eva. Uh, do you, or do you expect to, see a similar shift to habitual action in other addictions? Yeah, definitely. And it, this, uh, this has been shown for other addictions, but I think that really um, what I find the most interesting part is it, it is in the different addiction, which makes completely sense um, from what, what I see. Um, but what is really interesting, uh, Gillen and I have, have published a paper where they, they assess the pit effect in various disorders or in, in various aspects of disorders. And it's, it's really prevalent also in eating disorder and obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder. And that, that for me makes really sense. So it's, it's probably the idea to get from this dichotomous view of our diseases to a more continuous view. And that here the pit effect I find is quite elegant to, to be part of an explanation of how uh, various mental disorders in, in psychiatry actually develop and maintain. Thank you so much for answering that question. Then um, I have another message. Uh, thank you both uh, for two very interesting talks. Um, a question for Sarah. I would assume that mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with many mental disorders, uh, as for instance, PTSD as recently shown. Yeah, that is absolutely true. There's also some, there are also some studies about um, mitochondrial dysfunction and bipolar disorder. But I, I think that there's also what, what Eva said here. I, I, I mean, our diagnostic criteria or the way we diagnose mental disorders, mental diseases now, I just, I mean, it's just a construct and it's not, I think it's not um, showing or it's not, not relating to the underlying neurobiological mechanism. So I think, well, therefore that is the reason why we find a lot of cross disorder. Um, we have a lot, a lot of cross, cross disorder findings. And I think in the future we will have totally other uh, diagnostic uh, criteria or um, yeah, entities um, that are more related to the underlying neurobiological or um, epipathological um, mechanisms of the, of the mental disorders and will be more endophenotypes and subtypes with cross-disorder features. So that, that is the reason why you have so much cross-disorder findings because our diagnoses are still not, not true <laughs> in that way, but we need to work with something. So, but I think we, we in, in 20 years we will, we will not talk about like bipolar disorder, ADHD, PTSD, we will talk about different other terms and definitions. Then I have another question uh, for John Torres. Can you speculate on the challenges and opportunities of wearables and the integration of different types of data? So I think it'll be interesting in the future, right? If we're collecting smartphone data, it usually has to go through a phone manufacturer, be it Apple, be it Google, be it Samsung. So I think we'll see how much data they'll make available to researchers to use in ethical and safe ways. If the phone ecosystems become more restricted, I think what we'll see is wearables offer some potential. Of course, you have to think about what battery can be on a wearable, right? And how much storage can be on it? And does it have wireless capabilities to automatically upload data? So what's tricky about say using a Fitbit or kind of one of those devices is you have to automatically assume their step count or their algorithm works that's happening on the device. It can be hard to replicate it. 
and Fitbit could update its algorithm for what is a step or let's say a panic attack in the future, they have panic attack detection. That, that will be determined by the company. So I think wearables will be as good as the raw data we can do and we can do reproducible research. So I think there's still, again, if sensor kit, what I kind of show in those slides comes out and we can access it, that could be a huge boon to all of the research community and really help us again, look at the raw data underlying these diseases. So I don't have a great answer more because I think it's outside our control as the academic research community in some ways. Thank you so much. So um, I want to invite the audience to ask more questions if you want. So feel free to send more questions. Um, yeah, otherwise I would uh, slowly wrap up the session. And I would like to thank the BIH and the organizers, everyone who's involved uh, in this meeting for this wonderful session on clinical neuroscience. I want to thank all the speakers for this really diverse and interesting talks. And um, yeah, if you have any further questions, please feel free to uh, email um, the researchers. Oh, I don't understand. Oh, there's a few more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really bad in doing two things at the same time. I'm sorry, like reading and like understanding. But there are mo more questions. So, thank you a lot for your talks. I have a question for Professor Kittel Schneider. How will you transfer your findings from cell models and organo organoids, organoids to behavior in ADHD in the next step? Yeah, this, this is a really uh, good question. Um, we, I mean, what we, we we're planning uh, projects to um, sh to investigate uh, mechanisms that are associated with ADHD or mental disorders in general, and to to prove those, um, then or, or to to conduct those experiences or think of experience you could do in the cells and then also in animal models and then also find like an, um, a, a proxy in, in humans and to, to really see that you, that th those are the real mechanisms that are relevant for, um, for certain disorders or certain aspects or endophenotypes of mental disorders. This, uh, for example, you can do electrophysiological measures. You can do MIA microelectrode analysis, really complex electrophysiology in cell lines. And then you can, do EEG, for example, in, in mice, knockout mice, for example, or, um, and uh, uh, disease mice um, models. And then you can also do EEG and imaging in, in humans and, and target uh, specific aspects, like, for example, EI balance or something like that. And um, so I think um, this is, I mean, this is what all, like, the new research projects are about to, to really translate from cells to mouse or animal models, zebra fish, for example, and then to, to find something that correlates then in, in the humans. So I think it can be done, but we need to think what, what we can address like this really transnational overall models we have and then bring at least to humans and then also find treatment options and also investigate uh, different treatments in uh, the tr same translational way. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure and I know it can be done, <laughs> but you really have to think what, um, yeah, what relates to each other. Thank you. And I have one more question for Dr. Cho. Do you know whether oxytocin levels in the cerebrospinal fluid in PTSD are rather low or elevated? Could this be related with the duration of PTSD? Um, I um, actually cannot answer if there's an heightened or um, decreased um, CSF levels of oxytocin, but um, I think um, if you take the salience um, hypothesis, uh, which um, our first study has uh, confirmed, um, it's uh, difficult to say that um, you have um, um, continuously heightened or continuously decreased level of oxytocin um, since um, 
Um, I, I think um, the I think the background of this question is um, do the pe people with PTSD because they have already had a negative context which has been so um, um, so uh, significant continue to have significant intrusive symptoms because they have higher oxytocin level. Um, I don't think that is the case um, because it's um, it's. Um, uh, dependent on um, um, also individual uh, parameters. Uh, so what uh, I didn't um, explain because it was uh, only 15 minutes um, for the for this pre presentation. There are other fact factors involved. Um, Obviously, so um, f for one, there's the polymorphism of the oxytocin receptor, and there's a polygenic risk score, which um, uh, Dr. Friedel has uh, talked about as well for the PTSD and the MDD, uh, and these um, um, also gender differences uh, which play a role in the oxytocin um, system. So it's uh, difficult to say that um, uh, p people with PTSD have heightened oxytocin levels all the time or a decreased level of oxytocin all the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And people are really, really interested in PTSD. So where do you put your money? Oxytocin or MDMA for the treatment of PTSD? Um, <laughs> okay, um, that's a really good question. I, I guess it's um, uh, you're um, hinting at the um, new study on MDMA assisted um, therapy of PTSD. So um, me personally, um, I thought that study was really impressive and I would love to see more um, studies on the effect of MDNA in assisting um, PTSD therapy. Um, and I think um, the oxytocin system is really interesting. So um, I want to um, get to um, understand the oxytocin system a little more. But I think with the data we have now, or the evidence we have now, it's I think way too early to say it has a therapeutic um, um, uh, effect um, where it has therapeutic implications. So if you ask me personally, I would first put my money in MDNA. <laughs> and then maybe like uh, after some studies which have shown and validated um, that um, in, in a non-negative context, uh, oxytocin leads to decreased intrusive symptoms, uh, maybe also assisted with prolonged exposure therapy. Um, then maybe. Although there's a study um, that's uh, um, really new um, that has shown that um, the adding of oxytocin to uh, prolonged exposure th psychotherapy and PTSD did not have a more um, um, a an additive effect um, compared to placebo with uh, prolonged exposure therapy. So I will have to hold back my money for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. So now I'd like to wrap up our session. Um, and I want to thank everybody who contributed today um, to this really fruitful discussion. And we really um, had um, such a great um, uh, group of outstanding national and international researchers within the field of clinical neuroscience. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And um, I wish you a wonderful day and uh, continue the symposium. Thank you. <laughs>